Our next speaker had the, uh, the privilege of intimidating me greatly yesterday in the seminar I taught on uh, in space, uh, space Propulsion 101. I was uh, kind of uh, amazed to learn that I had someone in my class who actually could have been teaching the class. And I was uh, very pleased to have you make positive contributions, and it's, it was wonderful getting to, to know you a little bit better. Uh, Michael Minovich, Dr. Minovich, is a mathematician and the discoverer of the first numerical solution to the famous unsolved three-body problems in celestial mechanics. What this, in a practical sense, comes to is he the guy that gave is the guy that gave us planetary gravity assist maneuvers that ultimately enabled Voyager to do the grand tour. Okay, so in terms of our first probe to go out of the solar system, our first real interstellar Voyager, which is Voyager, uh, you're about to have the privilege of hearing the man who formulated the mathematics that led to the propulsion solutions that enabled that to happen. So we're going to be touching a little bit of, of interstellar space in the next talk. And Dr. Minovich is going to be uh, giving a talk on the topic of ground-to-orbit fusion propulsion systems for achieving commercial interplanetary space travel. And I'm also certain that if you corner him in a polite sort of way this weekend, he can tell you a little bit about that other little problem and the planetary gravity assist. But now we're going to hear something new and hopefully something is innovative. So Dr. Mitch. I don't have the microphone. <laughs> Use that. <laughs> oh, uh, you want me to speak into this? Yes, please. What about if I held it? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it's removable. Does it work either way? Yes, it does. Okay. Just pull You're all Because I'm going to be looking at the, uh, the slides. There you go. Okay, testing one, two, three. Um, I got my clock up here to make sure I don't go over for it because this is a long and complicated subject. Anyway, um, this is a tokamak. It was invented about 45 years ago by people in Russia. The object is to create a fusion reaction uh, to um, generate power, electricity, etc. Uh, we'll go to the, well, let me just say also that for the 40 years of research put into this, it has never achieved a self-sustaining fusion reaction. In fact, I don't think there's any fusion reactor ever, ever designed in, in the world that has successfully achieved um, a self-sustaining fusion reaction. Now, why is that? I believe it's because the magnetic pinch that's required to achieve the required plasma density has never been designed. It hasn't been um, tested. Or first of all, it hasn't been designed. And secondly, there's, there's nothing that approaches the required magnetic pinch. Now, two years ago, I was invited to participate in an um, interstellar conference by um, uh, Bill Kress over here, and uh, I was thinking about how uh, interstellar space travel could be achieved with relatively short, reasonable trip times. I concluded that it had to be a fusion drive, but there's no fusion propulsion system. So when I got into that, I, I, I looked at the problem of achieving the magnetic pinch as an intellectual mathematical problem. And um, for several months, without sleep, <laughs> I think I solved it. So if we go to the next uh, slide, um, having convinced myself that I had solved it, I then decided to throw away the deuterium-tritium uh, nuclear reaction process that the prior art has been using for 40 years and go to a very difficult one. And this difficult one is the one that is uh, going on every day um, without stopping for four and a half billion years, and that's the, the reaction, the nuclear reaction taking place in the sun. Now, with that um, said, I began uh, interested in getting the, the data on the sun's core, because that's what I, my aim was to find the, uh, the, the, the plasma density of the core 
to simulate that in my reactor design. So with this data here, uh, with the temperature of 1.5 times 10 to the 7th ke degrees Kelvin, uh, I just, I, you can work with these numbers and find that the, the required plasma density is 3.3 times 10 to the 31st protons per cubic meter. Now that's uh, two or three orders of magnitude above the tokamak or any other uh, fusion reactor. So uh, I'm looking at something that the prior art the thinks is uh, unachievable. Well, with the reactor I'm going to present to you right here, uh, I think it is achievable. Now the key to uh, realizing this very high uh, plasma density is the magnetic field. If you have a strong enough magnetic field and a cute enough um, a design of the fusion reactor, that combination plus a triggering with uh, phased array coherent lasers uh, giving you the uh, initial heating source, then you can achieve the, the center of the sun, the core, at the fusion ignition point and by feeding in more um, fuel, which is uh, photons, you can get a self-sustaining reaction. Let's go to the next slide. Now this, uh, I'm sorry about the, the uh, way this is presented, but this was copied from a report that a uh, few, maybe there's about two dozen of these on the table you can have. But anyway, I just wanted to describe how the energy output uh, is calculated. You get the the, uh, the mass of four protons, calculate that. You get the mass of the helium uh, product of that diffusion, and you notice there's a mass difference. You multiply that mass difference by uh, the square of the velocity of light, and you will get this number down here, which is, I have to look, 5.9 nine times 10 to the 11th joules per gram. Now, that's the, uh, the energy density of the fuel. The en energy density of kerosene, I think, is about 5,000 uh, joules per gram. So we're looking at orders of magnitude greater uh, energy density than anything in the prior art. But with that kind of energy density, um, you can do some amazing things. Also, with that uh, energy density, you can calculate the uh, kinetic energy or the, 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 uh, the, the velocity of the helium products after you get fission. <coughs> that energy is, is converted into kinetic energy, and that, can, that uh, velocity, uh, uh, the reaction velocity, is 3.45 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. The velocity of light is higher, of course, but uh, it's very, uh, very fast. Let's go to the next slide. But keep those numbers in mind. And this is the derivation of the uh, velocity. Uh, this is the mass flow. Mass flow is uh, F, the vehicle or the reactor propulsive thrust times the vehicle velocity divided by the uh, energy density of the resulting plasma, of the resulting reactor. Uh, the next equation, or, uh, is the uh, amount of fuel used to um, achieve a velocity increase from an initial velocity of V1 to a, a, a velocity V2 with a mass, vehicle mass M, uh, and when you divide that by twice the uh, energy density, and the energy density is extremely high, then this number here, the amount of fuel consumed, is microscopic. Now that will have a tremendous uh, impact on what I'm going to present. That is with constant vehicle mass, and if you have a, um, a, a vehicle situation where you want to accelerate a long time, where you're going to uh, use a lot of, uh, of uh, liquid uh, hydrogen fuel, then to calculate the amount, you need the rocket equation, the Tsiolkovsky rocket equation. I like to use his name a lot because it, he was the first to mathematically determine what that classical rocket equation is. 
and that's this equation down here. Now I'm not going to come back to this page. This is uh, I just wanted to fill you in um, regarding where the performance comes from. It comes from these mathematical equations that uh, cannot be argued with. That's what the facts show. These equations are correct. Let's go to the next slide. Now this is the, the actual reactor. Uh, this is new to the prior art. It's been patented. It's, the patent is uh, on its way. And the reason why I'm confident that we can get the fusion is because of the design. This is the internal plasma flow duct, which converges to a point. As the plasma is introduced at the front, it follows the line of magnetic inductions here, uh, almost parallel to the longitudinal axis of the duct, and the density of the plasma increases almost linearly as it goes along the this duct, and at this point, we're at, at this area here, um, almost at the end, this here distance is eight meters, this radius here is uh, one meter in radius, two meters in diameter, this is four meters in diameter, this is a magnetic nozzle, <clears throat> and this is a, um, one of the coils of this uh, superconducting solenoid. So it's a very thick superconducting solenoid here. And what does this design do? It gives the magnetic pinch right here where you need a tremendous magnetic field because I'm shooting for 3.3 times 10 to the 31st particles per cubic meter. And with that kind of uh, uh, plasma density, I need a really uh, huge magnetic field. And the way I solved or created that magnetic field was superconducting elements. Some of these are hybrid uh, coils because I don't know the state of the art right now in superconducting high field superconductors. But the magnetic field at the beginning here is 15 Tesla. At the end, at maximum, it's 100 Tesla. And by designing the coil in such a way, you can make the uh, magnetic field increase linearly as distance uh, is increased from the front to the rear. Uh, these dotted lines here are laser beams. There are 76 of them. It's all phase coherent, so the amplitude is uh, just an additive uh, of all of the uh, individual ones. That's what you need to get the initial temperature. And it's peripherally around there. This is a circular thing. Go to the next slide, please. Go to the, this is just a, uh, how the coils look. That's a transverse cross-section of the coil. That's a uh, longitudinal cross-section of the coil. Next slide. This is, uh, describes the magnetic field strength at various distances from the front of the coil, uh, front of the reactor. Uh, this um, is the most important uh, column. It gives the... Um, particle density, the plasma density, um, atoms per cubic meter, and we're shooting for 3.3 times 10 to the 31st. That is this situation right here. At this point, at, um, I can't read it, it's, uh, whatever it is, it's almost 7.7 .7, um, meters from the front of the um, reactor. That um, distance, is uh, will produce essentially the center of the, the core of the sun, and that's 7.95637 meters from the front, and that will produce a plasma density equal to the core of the sun. Uh, we have that plasma density, and we hit it with the simultaneously with phase coherent laser beams, and that will give us the trigger, and by feeding in more, um, uh, liquid uh, hydrogen in the ionized uh, liquid the plasma in the front, it, it will become self-sustaining. And the amount of thrust is determined by the mass flow rate of the, um, the injected uh, photons. Next one. Next slide. Can you hold the microphone a little closer? Okay. Now, um, in order to determine the performance 
we have to have some sort of idea of the mass that we're talking about. First of all, I want to sort of hold this picture up, if you can see it. This is what the vehicle will look like. And there's the engine, is, of course, that's the... Big picture on the There's a big picture right here. And uh, it's a commercial uh, vehicle. There's no military application here whatsoever. <laughs> and um, that's what it looks like. There's several pictures you can have of these uh, when you're going. Anyway, the uh, reactor, total reactor mass is 36,000 kilograms. Uh, the magnetic nozzle is 8,000 kilograms. The amount of fuel that is carried by this vehicle, and it's in a, uh, the third, the bottom level of the vehicle, is 150,000 kilograms of liquid hydrogen. It's liquid hydrogen, and cryogenic liquid hydrogen is stated, there's nothing new about that, it's 100 years old. The cooling system is 10,000 kilograms. Uh, subsystems relating support uh, 16,000. Total mass of the reactor plus the fuel, 220,000 kilograms. Now the vehicle structural mass is uh, 200,000 kilograms and the payload mass 100,000 kilograms. Total vehicle mass at takeoff is 520,000 kilograms. Now let's compare that to a takeoff of a 747. 747 prior to takeoff has a total mass of about, oh, I'm just guessing 350, 400,000 kilograms. So this is like one and a half times the total mass of a fully loaded 747. The dimensions of the vehicle are a little longer, about 350 feet long, uh, with a wingspan of, of just maybe 150 feet. Um, go to the next slide. Now keep in mind that that uh, mass there, total mass of the vehicle is 520,000 kilograms. These are the relativistic equations for calculating velocity, distance, time. Let's go to the next slide. This is what the vehicle looks like. Um, a longitudinal cross section here, there's the engine. Uh, the, in the fuselage is divided into three levels. The lower level contains the fuel. The middle level is um, components, well not components, related to passenger comfort. Might be a lounge, a restaurant, or um, baggage compartments. And then the upper level are uh, rows of seats. There's no middle aisle, it's uh, left or right, and one aisle is down the center. This is uh, a plan, plan view of the shape of the wings. Next slide. Okay, now what we're going to do here is to position the vehicle at the end of the runway, centered at, right uh, along the longitudinal center line axis of the line of the runway. With this kind of takeoff uh, condition, total mass 520,000 kilograms. The frontal area of the vehicle, aerodynamically speaking, is 100 meters square. And the density of the atmosphere we're assuming is normal sea level. And the drag coefficient, 0.25, all of this is just realistic um, aerodynamics. And um, this is what is fed into the computer uh, prior to takeoff. Now, the fusion engine is not started at the gate. The passengers are loaded and um, um, the vehicle is towed out to and aligned with the center line of the runway. When that occurs, the vacuum pumps of the uh, plasma flow duct and the magnetic nozzles will start so that you have to have uh, a very uh, strong vacuum in the uh, plasma flow duct and in the magnetic nozzle. That's the condition. Now we're going to uh, remember the passengers here are not astronauts. I'd say that they are between the age of uh, six months, little babies, up to uh, maybe a hundred or above or below. So we're looking at people that cannot sustain a very great acceleration. They could do a 0.1 G takeoff for normal 747. So that's what we're going to look at. This vehicle is going to describe the, uh, the acceleration uh, of a 747. So let's go to the next slide. With that, uh, 
with that precondition of the vehicle. Now we're going down the runway here, picking up speed, and the um, takeoff velocity is 146 miles an hour, and that requires a takeoff distance of 2,200 meters, which is a little over 7,000 feet. Now why am I calculating that? Because the purpose of this design, the purpose of the invention, was to provide a vehicle that could be operated from any major commercial <coughs> airport. This is not a, a Kennedy Launch Center vertical launch vehicle at all. This is uh, no different from the 747. So it's sitting at the end of the runway, only this one is not going to another city. It's going to some other place. That's a little further. Now, what is the uh, fuel consumed uh, during this takeoff run? It's very interesting because you want to compare it with a 747. And a 747 at takeoff, full thrust at about 7,000 um, feet on takeoff, consumes uh, several tons of kerosene. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it is one heck of a load. Now, the amount of uh, fuel that this engine cons consumes here, and this is, might sound science fiction, but it is not science fiction. Here's the fuel consumed uh, during takeoff. It's 0 0.0019 grams. What we're looking at, what would, what would this be? 1.9 micrograms of fuel. And the fuel is ordinary liquefied hydrogen. There's nothing, there's no deuterium in here, there's no tritium. It's, uh, you can get it from your glass of water here. Just uh, ionize that or sep do the separation and then put it in a cryogenic system, liquefy it, and that's what you're using as fuel. Okay, so now, go to the next slide. This, after airborne, um, I think we should look at a um, journey to low Earth orbit. 500 kilometer side, and we're going to use a very mild trajectory, ascent trajectory. Now, I was going to bring another slide that shows uh, the prior art ascent trajectories, which is vertical launch, uh, compared to this uh, trajectory, launch trajectory, which is a spiral with a very low inclination of about one degree. So, the way this is designed, remember, is to um, accommodate the passengers and they can't tolerate a very great acceleration so the, 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 the launch velocity or the ascent trajectory to the 500 kilometer uh, orbit is 0.1 g still you're just maintaining 0.1 g uh, with a low angle of attack so it's a spiral one degree above the local horizon but that requires three quarters of the way around the whole entire Earth. So when you're accelerating at 0.1 g, it requires uh, three quarters of the way around the planet, and at that end there, which is not long, you're going at orbital velocity 7.613 kilometers per second. So now you have delivered um, 300 or 400 passengers the to rendezvous with the uh, orbiting space station or an orbiting Hilton Hotel or a Doubletree Hotel like this. <laughs> now, so the question is, well, my gosh, uh, we're in this nice airplane or space vehicle and we're not burning too much fuel. Just for curiosity purposes, how much fuel did we burn? Well, the equation that will determine that um, amount of fuel was already presented before. It's right here. So if you do the, the, the numerical computation of this, you'll find that the amount of fuel is 25.49 grams. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And to uh, illustrate the amount of fuel needed to transport 300 passengers to low Earth orbit, this is the amount of liquefied hydrogen uh, that is required to carry out this transport of 300 people to low Earth orbit. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Now the next one 
is not stopping at low Earth orbit. We're going to go all the way to the moon. Now, if it only took a glass full of water, I mean a glass full of uh, liquid hydrogen to get up to uh, low Earth orbit, how much will it take to get all the way to the moon? Well, this is an interesting situation that's new to the, well, all of this is new to the prior art. But this is what is an interesting new feature to the interior of the fuselage of this vehicle. This is a passenger carrying vehicle, but we're going to be going at a higher acceleration because we're going to go to the moon. We're not going to stay at 0.1 Gs. Now, when we're above the atmosphere and the journey is not to stop at, at low Earth orbit but continue on to the moon, we're going to, after we're clear of the atmosphere, start to increase the acceleration slowly. It goes from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to 1. But something is happening in the fuselage while the vehicle is being accelerated. While the vehicle is being accelerated, all of the rows are being turned, it's being rotated, so that your head becomes this way gradually, so that the floor that this chair in, that your seat is resting on is always the floor of your perceived bottom. So it doesn't, when you're, when you're getting up to 1G, uh, your, your acceleration is such that you're sitting down this way, the vehicle is moving this way at 1G, so um, you can drop a penny or you can read a book, and you couldn't tell whether you're on a vehicle going uh, at an acceleration of uh, 1G or home reading a book or watching a baseball game or something. Well, that is an interesting innovation of the way this interior of the vehicle is uh, designed. So it's very mild. Uh, now, the acceleration continues at 1G to the halfway point, halfway to the moon, um, and, it, and the uh, time lapse to reach the halfway point to the moon is 1.74 hours. No, so that's, a, I mean, it's not science fiction. I want to emphasize that that's what it is. When that is reached, the vehicle uh, is, um, well, you have to be strapped in at this point. And then the engine is shut down. The vehicle has turned 180 degrees, the engine has started up again, uh, acceleration builds up to 1G again, you're decelerating. The passengers are now uh, being decelerated, but they, as far as they're concerned, the gravity that they feel is still on the floor, they drop a penny, it's still there. So there's no nothing beyond 1G. Now, when the astronauts go up to orbit in the shuttle, they're they have to endure up to seven Gs. Well, little ladies or young women carrying babies, they can't go to seven Gs. So uh, what this vehicle is designed to do is to transport ordinary people all over the solar system. Well, right now we're just going to the moon. So the answer is, what is the total flight time to the moon? Well, that answer is 3.48 hours. Now, if you want to do a return, you don't want to stop there. and You can just go slowly around the moon, decelerate, and then uh, accelerate coming back uh, and land at the same airport or another airport. The total trip time, round trip to the moon in an aircraft-like vehicle with comfortable Earth-like environment, gravity, and, <coughs> excuse me, gravity environment, is 6.95 hours. That's less than a trip from LAX to JFK. And the maximum speed is 61.48 kilometers per second. Now the next slide, we go to the next one. Well, if we could do that uh, by just the trips to the moon, what can we do uh, in terms of interplanetary space travel? Well not exceeding uh, 1G acceleration, the trip time to um, Mercury um, is 2.9 days. The trip time to Venus, this is one way, and that includes uh, acceleration and deceleration. 
No, no, no. Yes, it includes the deceleration. Uh, Venus is also 2.9, and Mars is uh, 3.5 days. Jupiter is 6.5. Let's look at the fuel consumption. The total fuel it would be one way would be 35,290 uh, kilograms of uh, liquid uh, hydrogen. That's going to Mercury. Same for going to Venus. This is um, not Holman trajectories. It's not gravity assist trajectories. It's direct, almost line of, of flight. So we don't worry about conser conserving fuel at all. So with this kind of an engine, um, we're just um, going to get the shortest uh, trip time without exceeding one G. So Pluto, uh, the amount of fuel one way is 185,000 kilograms, and that's being accelerated uh, at one G. The maximum velocity going to Pluto is 7,612 kilometers per second. So you're going, as a matter of fact, this is 0 0.03 C. So you're already three-tenths of a velocity of light. So that's why I um, presented the, the equations of dynamics, relativistically speaking. So, and this, these passengers are, are just ordinary passengers that you would find in a trip uh, leaving LAX to, um, to uh, New York. However, the trip times are longer. As I said, uh, it's 2.9 days to go one way to Mercury. Uh, to Mars, it's 3.5 days. To Jupiter, 6.5 days. And Pluto is 18 days total. And I think I... Yeah, Dr. Did Nobis, my, maybe a couple of minutes and then we need to take questions. Did I uh, convince people that this is actually real? Or is it actually, it's intended to be real? <laughs> Ready for questions or any kind of flack or mud balls you want to throw at me. I really don't care. But I'm just happy to be here because the mentality of this group is real positive. It's a hard problem to achieve, but we're all interested in things like this that appear to be science fiction, but we're here to make it science fact. Okay, we have some questions. Do we have the roving microphone yes. somewhere? Yeah, uh, go ahead and, and uh, look like, I guess Patricia maybe was the first with the question back there. And then we'll... Yes, thank you. Uh, what do you see as the major impediment to achieving this? Oh, the fusion reactor. I'm going to use the microphone. Yes. The fusion reactor, that would, that's the starting point, uh, aerodynamically speaking. Uh, one other thing I didn't mention or, or um, um, explain as a problem, this thing re-enters the atmosphere, not flat like this shuttle, but it burrows in nose first. You won't see a cockpit on this airplane because the front of this airplane is a special metal that can withstand heat. Now, I haven't solved that problem yet, but this comes burrowing in at a very slight angle, and the deceleration occurs over almost the whole circumference of the Earth's upper atmosphere. Very slow. We, we remember, we don't want to exceed 1G, either going or coming back. So, um, that, that's a very good question, and um, that should answer that question. We focus on the reactor, and let me uh, also say that the professional reactor people that are looking at this, or maybe looking at this in the near future, are they have a feeling I'm not certainly a reactor specialist. I, my degree is not even in physics, so um, <laughs> I, I have no business talking about these things. However, um, I like problems that are very difficult, and I think this is a, a problem that will keep physicists and uh, reactor engineers uh, at their table to either just, I don't think that it is impossible. I think the reactor design is sound. Next question. Yeah, this will be the last one. We probably only have time for one and then we need to get to our last speaker. Uh, okay. So let's, let's go to Steve, right here in the painting. 
So I, I, I do a lot of looking at uh, fusion type propulsion and for uh, space mission design. And, uh, and in fact, I was just sitting here looking at a different uh, antimatter propulsion system uh, during the breakouts. But what um, what is the the specific impulse range that you are calculating that, that uh, this propulsion system would generate? The specific impulse of this vehicle, yeah. <coughs> this propulsion system. Oh, a mi uh, probably several million. Several million. <laughs> Need to change that leaves me speechless uh, <laughs> as the in-space propulsion guy. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Moore. <laughs>